Hi YouTube, so you're looking for the best way to convert your colour images into black and white using Darktable. Well, you've come to the right place. Let's get into it. Hi and welcome to episode 28 of Understanding Darktable, a long overdue episode. My apologies, we'll have a bit of a chat at the end as to why it's taken so long and a few other viewer questions and bits and pieces to cover. But right now, let's dive into monochrome processing with Darktable. I put an email out to the Darktable user list, the email list, and asked for people's suggestions. I said, look, you know, people have asked me to do a video on monochrome processing. What are the methods that I should consider covering in such a video? And I got a few responses back via the mailing list, and we're going to address some of those right now. Jean-Paul Gorsch said, Hello Bruce, I just saw your request on the mailing list for black and white processing. It is possible to do this with the channel mixer module. There are profiles to simulate silver films in the documentation. And I'll put the link to that in the description down below. So let's jump on in and have a look at that. This is an image I shot probably four years ago uh, here in New South Wales at a place called Swans Crossing. And I thought this would be nice sample image for a black and white landscape so we'll jump over to the color modules and we will look for channel mixer now if we look at the presets for the channel mixer there's black and white black and white artifacts boost black and white blue artifacts reduce black and white smooth skin okay let's give those a try so there we go bog standard black and white image and if we look at all of the channels that we've got here we've got hue saturation lightness red which has a value of one on the red channel obviously green which has a value of one on the green channel blue which has a value of one on the blue channel and then we've got a gray channel now by default if I was to set all of these values back to zero, you might think we're going to end up with black, but actually when they're all at zero, we come back to a color image. The moment we set these sliders for this gray output channel to anything other than zero, the image becomes monochrome straight away. And it immediately looks underexposed. And the reason for that is because all three of these sliders need to add up to values that are close to a value of 1.0. Okay, so we can increase one particular color channel until we get up to around about 1.0, and our histogram stretches pretty much the full width as it should, and we've basically just used the information from the blue channel of the original RAW file. But we can use other color channels and then reduce the blue. And you'll find that whenever we get the histogram close to the right hand side, the sum of these three values will be very close to 1.0. May not be exact, and that's fine. Uh, if it comes to a little bit more than 1.0, then you're obviously compensating for deficiencies in the original exposure. It might have been a little bit underexposed. If the sum of all these values comes to something a little bit less than 1.0, means that the original image was probably a little overexposed and you've just compensated for that in the process. But the point is that we can use these three sliders to choose different parts of the color spectrum to create a different black and white mix. So that's one approach. So Jean-Paul, thank you very much for the tip. That sounds like a great place to start. So we will undo that. And we'll move on to the next email. Bob Tregulus said, Hi Bruce, I mostly use just the shadows and highlights, tone curve and exposure modules to adjust the contrast. I never use the brightness contrast saturation module in either my colour or black and white work. My starting baselines are tone curve, medium contrast, Shadows and highlights, shadows at 10, highlights at 64, compressed 20, and exposure, black point set to 40. Now, Bob, I followed all of that, but 
there's nothing in there that actually takes a color image and converts it to black and white. So I don't know if I've misunderstood what you were saying or if there was another step in there that you just forgot to include in your email. Uh, but simply following those instructions does not end up with a black and white image. So if we go tone curve and we'll go with the medium contrast, then you said shadows and highlights, shadows at 10, highlights at 64, compression at 20, and then the exposure module and moving the black point to 40, but you can't go to 40. You can only go to 1. Uh, maybe you meant 0.4? Nope. I don't know. I'm sorry, Bob. I, I'm really not sure where you were going with that one, mate. I suspect that there was another step in the process that you perhaps didn't include in your email. Never mind. Um, feel free to chime back in, flick me another email or comment down below and let us know if there was some other step that was meant to be included. Anyway, we shall move on. August Schwerdfeger, apologies if I've butchered that pronunciation, August, uh, said, I mostly use the saturation slider in the color correction module since that is the only way to get an untinted grayscale image whether or not tinting has been applied through the module. I've also used the channel mixer module a few times for trickier desaturation operations, although I've not used the ready-made black and white presets. Okay, so August, the color correction module. We'll just undo those three things that we did there and we'll go over to color correction. And if we set this saturation slider to zero, we now have a monochrome image. And as you would imagine, it doesn't really matter where we drag this control point, it makes no difference to our black and white image simply because this is a color correction module and we have no color information. So if you do want a purely black and white image with no tint, you know, introduced into the monochrome rendition whatsoever, then follow August's tip and use the color correction module with the saturation set to zero. Thank you, August. The next email I saw on the mailing list was from Matthew Moy, and Matthew said, probably not widely used, but very powerful, the color zones module. Saturation tab, move the curve to zero everywhere. A preset black and white film does this. Then use the lightness tab to choose which color should be light or dark. Very interesting. So we'll just wind our history back, go to the color zones module. As he said, there's a preset here called black and white film, which will set all of those nodes to essentially grayscale. And then we can use the lightness curve to choose which tones we want to accentuate in our black and white conversion. I really like this, Matthew. Thank you. This was not something that I'd come across, and I think when I do any monochrome processing from here on, this is the method I'm going to use. I really like this. So basically, this is like the channel mixer, but on steroids, where the channel mixer just gives you red, green, and blue. This gives you, you know, six different nodes so you can target different parts of the color spectrum to be either light or dark. So if we wanted all of the, the reds and the, you know, orangey parts of the spectrum to be bright, we could simply reduce all of the other parts and crank up the reds always watching our histogram of course and just lift that up so that would be one approach but foliage which always looks green to our eyes always falls in the yellow part of the spectrum so what if we wanted to brighten up the foliage we could darken everything else make sure this node here is over the yellows and here comes our foliage into the mix. Oh, love that. 
That is just gorgeous, Matthew. That is a great technique. So, yeah, I've, I've got to say, I'm thinking that the Color Zones module is probably the method I'm going to use whenever I want to do any black and white conversions from here on. I should go and find a portrait image so we can muck around with a portrait image and just see how this could affect skin tones. I'll do that in a sec. Okay, and there are two other modules that we can use for monochrome conversion. One, as previously mentioned, is the contrast, brightness and saturation module. And that just has a very quick and dirty saturation slider that we can drag down to zero. And again, we've got, like I said, just a bog standard black and white conversion. Really no thinking required. Let's undo that. And the final one, of course, is the monochrome module. Now, the monochrome module is, and has been, I will confess, my go-to up until now for black and white conversion. Uh, what we've got is this series of coloured squares which represent our colour spectrum, and this white circle which we can change the size of with our mouse wheel. I will confess to not really understanding what the size of the circle does in relationship to the way the monochrome image is rendered. But what you can do is left click and drag to different areas of the color matrix to choose that part of the color spectrum for your conversion mix, if you like. So want more blues, drag towards the blue. Obviously the further away from the center you get than the more underexposed the image ends up. So it would suggest that you would then need to go and apply some sort of brightening, whether it was through a tone curve or filmic module or you know brightness, contrast, saturation, one of those other modules. So like I said, up until now, it's the one I've used for my monochrome conversions, but I think going forward, thanks to Matthew, I will be using the Color Zones method simply for the diversity that it gives you and the you know, just the control. It's fantastic. Okay, before we go, let's go and have a look at a portrait and see how this could work, you know, using the Color Zones module with skin tones. Okay, so I've got another image of the lovely Desiree, and we will grab our Color Zones module, and we will go with our black and white film preset, and looking at our lightness curve here, we can now start deciding which parts of the spectrum we want to use for our monochrome mix. Yeah, right. I like this. I like this a lot. Yeah. Wow. Okay. So, obviously, you could choose for yourself which parts of the spectrum you wanted to use. Uh, I, I'm thinking, you know, the yellows and the reds are obviously where we're going to get the lightest, creamiest looking skin tones, but I'm sure those of you who have spent more time doing monochrome processing of portraits have probably got some tips to add to this, so please comment away down below because it's not an area I've spent a lot of time dabbling in, and if you've got stuff to share, please do. I'm sure everyone will appreciate it. Okay, so that's going to do it for black and white conversion of color images in Darktable. As promised at the beginning, got a little bit of stuff to cover, so here goes. We're 28 episodes into this series, and one thing I have not done that almost every other YouTuber does is implore their viewers to hit the subscribe button. And... I didn't want to go down that path because I thought, well, if people want to subscribe, they'll subscribe. But what I have noticed from my YouTube stats is that two out of every three people viewing my videos is not a subscriber. And although I never set out to make money from this, it would be nice to earn a little bit of money from this YouTube channel just to, I don't know, I guess justify the time and effort that I put into it. Um, in order to monetize a channel on YouTube, you need to reach a certain threshold of subscribers and minutes viewed. And I'm getting close, but there's still some way to go. So I would ask, if you are 
the sort of person who's watching every video that I release in this series, please do hit the subscribe button. It would help me a lot. Uh, and that's the first and last time I'll say, well, I probably shouldn't say it's the last time I'll say it, but it's the first time that I've said it. So if you could, that'd be great. Thank you. On a sort of related note to that is if you got some value out of any of my videos, please hit the thumbs up uh, because that will help the YouTube algorithm to pick up on the videos that I'm producing and promote them to people who are looking at other videos of a similar nature. So if someone's looking for image processing or they're looking for how to do black and white conversions, if I get enough likes on this video, then YouTube will suggest this video to other people who may not have otherwise discovered my channel. So if you could give it a thumbs up, that would be much appreciated. Thank you. You may have also noticed that I changed the name of the YouTube channel. It was audio to you and it's now Bruce Williams Photography. The reason for that was years and years and years ago I created this channel and I called it audio to you because that is the name I generally go by all around the internet because my day job, I'm an audio engineer. I work in radio. Uh, you probably never knew that until now. And originally I was thinking that I would create some content along those lines. And then, you know, photography's always been a love, sometimes a paying <laughs> love, uh, but most of the time just a, a hobby. And I discovered Darktable a few years ago, and, you know, as I've said previously, got to the point where I thought, you know, really need some good quality tutorials on this, and I haven't found a lot that's really blown me away, so I'm going to throw my hat in the ring. And so I figured, well, now I'm, you know, 20 plus episodes into this, I should probably just give the channel a name that's more reflective of what we're doing here, which is photography. So I've used Bruce Williams Photography because I have that registered as a .com. If and when I get around to creating a channel of audio related content, I'll create a new channel again called Audio to You and I'll start from scratch there. So just wanted to let you know why I had changed the name of the channel for those that were interested. A few people wrote about the retouch module. They were Erica Saez, Jarrett McAllister, and Lau Johnson, who all said the last square in the retouch module, the white one, is the blur layer. And that is really handy for working on just discoloration within the skin when it's not actually a blemish per se but just a you know maybe a slightly reddish area on the skin or something like that the blur layer is a great way to smooth out those discolorations so that you get an even skin tone so thank you to those guys for bringing that to my attention and now to your attention christian zick said the passion, man, you are the Steve Irwin of Linux photo editing. <laughs> I love the somewhat technical explanations. It really shows me how Lightroom is making me stupid. <laughs> what a great quote. <laughs> I love that, Christian. Thanks, mate. Uh, and Heyo Maria Vasconcellos Fontes de Barros Taviera. Dude, I am sure you've added a couple of extra names to your name because it was not that long before. <laughs> he said, I'm sorry to tell you, but Fujifilm doesn't have DSLRs. They just have mirrorless. Mate, well spotted. I absolutely did say that in the retouch video. Was it the retouch video or was it the filmic video? Whichever one it was, my apologies, and you are absolutely correct. Fujifilm makes mirrorless, not DSLR. So thank you for picking that up. And the last thing I wanted to mention was my PC rebuild. Uh, that is the reason for why I haven't had a video out for probably a month now. Uh, about two and a half weeks ago... Jeez. No, it'll be three weeks ago now. Uh, I bought a new motherboard, new processor, new RAM, new graphics card, new case, and built a new PC. All the PCs that I've owned over the last 20 years have been machines that I built myself. And what, what I was struggling with uh, with the old build of my PC was that I just I couldn't get my video footage to play back smoothly. It was just jittery and dropping frames and it was just a nightmare to edit. And I decided, you know what, 
it's been five years since I updated the hardware in this box. Maybe I'm due, <laughs> you know, so, so yeah, so I've upgraded to, for those who are interested in the technical specs, uh, AMD Ryzen 7 2700X, which is sort of their top of the line processor at the moment, 32 gigs of uh, 2400 megahertz RAM, uh, MSI motherboard, uh, just the graphics card I didn't go super hardcore it's just a 1050 Ti uh, and people might think wow why wouldn't you spend more money on the graphics card if you're doing video editing well I use Magix Vegas for my video editing and Magix Vegas doesn't actually use the NVIDIA uh, CUDA cores for its video rendering. It only uses them for things like transitions. So when you see me do those little page flips of my headshot down into the bottom corner and things like that, that's the only time the graphics card's actually doing anything heavy. All the rest of the time it's CPU and RAM. So what I'm finding now is that my system is absolutely gorgeous. The reason it took so long for me to get a new video out was because when I bought all this new stuff and I got it home and I ripped apart my old machine and I put all the new components in and I fired it up in the BIOS I was seeing four slots of eight gigs of RAM but the BIOS was saying system RAM was 16 gigs and I was like what what's going on there and what it came down to was a faulty motherboard only two of the RAM slots were actually being correctly identified even though the bios was showing all four slots populated it was only reading the ram from two of the slots so as a consequence i you know because i'm a diy guy when it comes to my pc builds i struggled with it for a few days and eventually got to the point where i went no nah, something's not right here picked up the whole box, took it back to Sydney to, or took took it to Sydney with the new components in it to the place where I bought the components. And I said, guys, can you have a look at this? Because something's not right. And I knew it was not anything I'd done. I would know how to build a PC. And they came back to me a couple of days later and said, ah, oh, faulty motherboard. We've replaced the motherboard for you now. It's all good. So that was why there was a lengthy delay Oh, and then to add insult to injury, once I got the system back home, I fired it up, went in, and as you know, I run a dual boot system. I've got Windows 10, which I use for all my audio and video production work, and I run Linux for everything else. I've booted into Windows, checked all my software, yep, everything's working, Windows is fine, fired up Vegas, opened up an old project, played back beautifully. I'm like, oh, this is just fantastic try to render vegas would crash every single freaking time i tried every codec imaginable and the minute you told it to start rendering it would crash and i eventually got to the point where i went you know what there is absolutely no way around this i am going to have to reformat windows reinstall from scratch reinstall all my software from scratch <laughs> So the whole of the third week, the week that's just gone, has been me getting my system back up and running. So, um, yeah, that's, that's sort of the long version of the story as to why there was such a long break between videos. So my apologies. But we're up and running. As you can see, I've had a bit of a play with the lighting situation where I used to have a small softbox just sitting up here. I've now got a much larger softbox up here. Whether I'll do this every time, I don't know. I must admit, looking at my footage on my phone here, I do prefer the look of this. It's given me the ability to light my face better but keep the rest of the office fairly dark, which I kind of like. Um, it's just it takes up too much space to leave it there all the time and it's you know probably 10 or 15 minutes work to set it all up you know when i want to shoot a video having said that 10 or 15 minutes out of the you know four hours that i spend creating one video it's probably worth doing so yeah i'll do that also i've ceased to use the lav mic that i used to use you know attached to my shirt uh, I am now using my beautiful uh, ribbon microphone, which sits on the desk here. I've um, 
deliberately kept it out of the <laughs> shot so that you don't have to see it. But for those that are interested in it, that is a ribbon microphone. And yes, up beside my head, it really is that large. Um, this is a absolutely gorgeous microphone. Apologies for the handling noise as I put it back on the desk. Um, beautiful microphone and it's what I use for my podcasting and occasionally I have people come to my home to record voiceover demos and they generally use this mic as well. So this is probably the way I'm going to work from now on. I much prefer the lighting situation. I've done some testing of this recording setup and much prefer the audio off this microphone than off the lav mic. Hopefully you can hear the difference and I think that pretty much does it. Uh, again, thank you for all the love, the likes, the subscribes. Keep them coming. Do appreciate that. And I'll talk to you soon.